please join me in welcoming Minister Lee. Thank you very much, Professor Perkovic and Sophie as MC. I'm very conscious, everyone, that my pink is clashing badly with the purple here and the red here. Um, can I also acknowledge the traditional owners of country and say that I, as Health Minister, understand that the health of our first Australians is very much connected to the health of the land. And what a beautiful country. Uh, we're all, or most of us in the federal parliament, I'm not talking about the senators, um, in the lower house are representatives of a constituency in our own right. And mine is a third of Western New South Wales. So while I live in Albury and I have my main office there, I have a second office in Broken Hill. And I haven't spoken to anyone there this morning, but I'm very hopeful that the rain is reaching the far west, which is very drought stricken at the moment. Thank you to the George Institute again for organising today's seminar to mark World Health Day. There are many challenges as well as many advances in world health for all of us to contemplate. At times it feels as though a new research finding is announced every day. That's wonderful, but the potential that these discoveries hold cannot be delivered without action at a different level. Hence the topic I've chosen for today, health system reform. It seems to me that there are three essential ingredients or elements in any effective, high quality, modern health system. Firstly, an efficient system structure with secure funding. Secondly, clinical practice that is both accessible and evidence-based. And thirdly, well-targeted research to underpin constant improvement. Each of these elements can lead to improvements, but a health system cannot continue to deliver good health outcomes over time unless all three elements are in good working order and working together. That's true for any national health system, including our own. For most of the 20th century, our health system worked very well. According to the most recent Global Burden of Disease study, of the top 15 countries by income per capita, Australia had the 12th lowest health spending, but the second highest healthy life expectancy and the fourth lowest level of premature mortality. Good results, but they largely reflect the past. It's well documented that to cope with the challenges of the 21st century, our health system must be both more effective in caring for patients and more cost effective. As it is now, the system is not dealing effectively with the leading cause of illness, disability and death in Australia, namely chronic disease. It's been estimated that in 2011, chronic diseases accounted for 90% of all deaths. The incidence and costs of chronic diseases continue to grow rapidly. These largely preventable diseases require a different approach from the episode-based healthcare that was developed and implemented during the mid to late 20th century. This is directly linked to the other side of the equation, cost effectiveness. The surge in chronic disease has been a major factor behind the rising cost of Medicare, which has more than doubled from about $10 billion to almost $20 billion over the past decade. Coupled with an aging population, the constant demands of new technology and new medicines will continue adding to these pressures. Equity of access and of outcomes are absolutely important and the government is committed to ensuring that all Australians continue to have access to the health care they need. That's why we are spending record amounts on health care. This year we've budgeted $67 billion for health care, rising to $74.2 billion in 2017-18. By 2027-28, it is estimated that the Australian Government will be spending $124 billion a year on healthcare annually. But just spending more will not solve our underlying problems and more money does not necessarily mean better care. We need reform in the three areas I have outlined, system structure, clinical practice and research. Reform is essential to improve patients' health and to ensure the system is adaptive and affordable in the future. The new primary health networks model will deliver funding to frontline health services at a regional level, 
instead of the backroom bureaucracy too often observed in the past. The model of our new PHNs is particularly valuable for improving links between local health services and hospital care to ensure that patients receive the different types of care they need. The coordination of health services is not a new concept, originating with the, it originated with the divisions of general practice and then was morphed into the Medicare locals of the previous government, but that model was, in our view, fragmented, expensive and had very variable results. So from the 1st of July this year, the 61 Medicare locals will be replaced by 31 primary health networks. PHNs will pick the best features of Medicare locals and most importantly will put general practice back at the centre of patients' care. They will align more closely with state and territory health networks, working directly with GPs, other healthcare providers and hospitals. PHNs will improve the productivity of the health system by helping patients to avoid repeated admission to hospital at high cost to the health system. They will also target people at risk of poor health with six key priorities. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, mental health, population health, health workforce, e-health and aged care. The current Medicare funding model developed decades ago has not kept pace with the changing landscape in primary care. Its focus is on sickness and treatment, not the prevention and management of chronic conditions. Last financial year, Medicare subsidised 5.6 million GP chronic disease management items. My consultations over recent months with doctors have highlighted that those items involve excessive red tape, don't reflect best practice and don't always provide the best support to patients most in need. Doctors are also deeply concerned about issues from over-testing and outdated or unproven treatments to unnecessary referrals, duplication, inefficiencies and systematic waste. Additionally, they've raised concerns with the MBS fee-for-service structure that they believe needs addressing to enable Medicare to support appropriate clinical care now and into the future. Now, blended funding models are not new in Australian health. They started with the Australian Divisions of General Practice and the Practice Incentives Program. Blended funding models could provide fixed fees for some services and also potentially block funding for patients with ongoing chronic disease. States and territories are also currently trialling a range of innovative funding models for rural and remote Australia for patients at risk of hospitalisation. We can also greatly improve the operation of Medicare by thoroughly reviewing the services and items that are funded and how they are used. Medical interventions which are duplicated, unnecessary, ineffective or even harmful are a burden on patients and on the health system. An overhaul of the MBS is long overdue. Such a review will ensure that all medical therapies and technologies funded by Medicare are evidence-based and effective leading to a more efficient system. A number of clinician-led reviews of specific areas of the MBS have already been done, resulting in better targeting of existing items, realignment of fees across item groups, and removal of some out-of-date items. Just three recent reviews of vitamin D, folate, and B12 have resulted in changes that will save around $310 million over the forward estimates period. Additional areas for review will be prioritised based on advice from professional groups, evidence about variation between clinical practices and other sources. Obtaining evidence about how other practices perform will also help doctors to assess their own performance. Which brings me to the next big area for systemic reform, the federal system. What seemed like a straightforward division of responsibilities between the Commonwealth and states in 1901 is now very complex and confusing. Our federation needs reform and the government has begun the process. We've released an issues paper on the division of roles and responsibilities in health and discussions and consultations are currently underway. Untangling the web of federal state responsibilities will not be easy 
because let's be honest, getting nine governments to agree on anything can be difficult, let alone agreement on major structural reform. I have no doubt that with the right goodwill, this process will produce solutions to ensure that our healthcare system investment is spent effectively on patient care and not wasted on duplication and inefficient administration. Better use of information and knowledge is another way to improve patient outcomes. But greater use of IT in health has the potential to also improve efficiency and improve access. Doctors at present often have to make diagnoses without the benefit of complete information about their patients. E-health patient records facilitate better coordinated care by practitioners and eliminate guesswork, which often results in duplication of tests and treatments, or worse, the wrong medication or treatment. Improvements to e-health in time will reduce the duplication and number of preventable hospital admissions, which are a major cost to the health system, but more importantly, improve the care and treatment provided to patients. As an indication of the scale of the current problem, in 2012-13, around 400,000 presentations to emergency departments were due to adverse drug events alone. Even without considering the cost of hospital admissions, a 50% cut in these emergency department visits would save the hospital system around $67 million a year. The government is keen to maximise the benefits of e-health. We are carefully considering the recommendations of the personally controlled electronic health system review and we're taking time to get this right. Australia has been a world leader in health and medical research and the government is committed to ensuring this continues. Research can transform patients' lives, transform health practices and transform our health system. It's also a great investment for our nation. The George Institute for Global Health is unique among medical research institutes in that it supports research in every part of the health system, not just raw basic research, but research into clinical practice and whole of health systems. The projects for which you received funding last year from the National Health and Medical Research Council, totalling $11.3 million, reflect this. They range from reducing death rates from infection in intensive care units to re-examining the use of paracetamol for back pain. It's been estimated that every dollar spent on health and medical research generates a health benefit valued at more than $2. In addition to this, these are, are the broader economic benefits of employment and wealth generated by new medicines and new technologies. The government remains committed to establishing the Medical Research Future Fund announced in last year's budget. After reaching the target of $20 billion, this perpetual fund will provide an additional investment of $1 billion each year to medical research. It's a visionary project which will transform the outlook for health and medical research in Australia, leading to better health care and better health. So it's for all these reasons that today I can announce that the Abbott government will undertake a significant review of the Medicare benefits schedule focusing on three priority areas. Firstly, we will establish an MBS review task force led by Professor Bruce Robinson, Dean of the Sydney University Medical School. This task force will consider how services can be aligned with contemporary clinical evidence and improve the health outcomes for patients. Secondly, we will also establish a primary healthcare advisory group led by former AMA President Dr. Steve Hambleton. The role of this advisory group will be to investigate options to provide better care for people with complex and chronic illness, new and innovative care and funding models, and ways to develop a greater connection between primary health care and hospital care. It's my expectation that the primary health care advisory group will consult and engage widely with the professions, consumers, insurers, state and territory governments and the private sector. I will want to receive practical proposals to streamline the care we provide for people with complex care needs, create incentives for the primary health care sector to keep patients well and out of hospital, explore new payment arrangements to better support our health professionals to do what they do best for patients 
and propose new roles for the health insurance sector to better manage the risk of poor care outcomes and preventable hospital admissions. Our PHNs provide a new mechanism to support better coordinated care. And I'm also keen to get the advice from the Primary Healthcare Advisory Group as to how we can get the best out of our primary health networks. I'm expecting concrete, pragmatic policy proposals to emerge from this process before the end of this year, ready for active consideration and decision by government. Finally, the third priority area will be for the government to work with clinical leaders, medical organisations and patient representatives to develop clearer Medicare compliance rules and benchmarks. While the vast majority of clinicians across Australia provide quality health care to their patients, there are a small number who don't always do the right thing when using Medicare. The development of clearer Medicare compliance rules and benchmarks will encourage a better use of Medicare. Now these reforms will be an ongoing process and each of these task forces will report back in late 2015. We are committed to protecting the cost effectiveness and sustainability of the government's investment in Medicare and ensuring that universal access to healthcare remains for all Australians for the long term. We must never forget that ensuring a better outcome for patients is the most important reason for the health system and for health reform. Through reform of the health system, structures, clinical practices and research to ensure that all Australians can receive appropriate quality health care as we head deeper into the 21st century is the number one priority of the health portfolio. It's never easy to get agreement on change in an area as important as this, but the Australian Government is taking the lead in this important area and we hope and expect that sensible, long overdue reforms will gain wide support. As a nation, we do need to act now to get our health system up to date so the health care available to us tomorrow and in 30 years is the best it can be. Thank you. Thank you.